Welcome everyone. We will be starting in the next few minutes. If you would like to place your name and information or introduce yourself and where you're from in the chat, please do now. And we will review a couple of um, quick tips here in the next few minutes, okay? Welcome, everyone. I know a few of you are just kind of trickling in, but um, we'll kind of get ready on some housekeeping rules here in the next two minutes, and then we'll start exactly at 11.15. Hey, Miss Amy. So, welcome everyone. I know um, a few more will be joining us, but I want to go ahead and introduce myself again. If you haven't um, met me, my name is Brenda Pinner. I'm one of the community engagement liaisons. So thank you for joining us on the Fort Worth Urban Village Development Program. Um, this workshop will be given by Mr. Eric Flatterker with Planning and Data Analytics Department. And so... And so um, I just want to let you know, like, please, um, there is a chat box on the top right. That is where you're at right now. Feel free to um, write anything, give feedback, um, say hey, anything like that. Introduce yourselves. I see Catherine is popping in. As well. <laughs> hey, friend, how are you doing? Doing all right. Good, 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 good. How's it going? I know. Well, okay. So you have like the best person helping you host. So Brenda's got this and you know, you don't have to stress at all. It's going to be great. Cool. Just wanted you just wanted to come and say thank you. And I know what a hassle it was to do, get all this together for us, but it's going to be great. And also wanted to tell you that for the first session, we had over 400 people online in different workshops. So second session is going to be even more, I am sure. So it's going to be great. Good luck. I'm going to pop off and then kind of come in and out as an attendee. So you won't see my face anymore, but I am kind of watching to see, to see how you guys are doing. So good luck, Eric. It's going to be good. Thanks, Catherine. 
Happy to do it. You're very welcome. Okay, y'all do good. Hey, Mr. George, it's good to see you and Bonnie Bray. I've been looking at houses secretly at Bonnie Bray area as well. So <laughs> glad that y'all are here. So as I was saying, um, you are on the chat function. If you look at your top right right now, um, if you, you feel free to introduce yourself, do anything there. There is a question um, tab right below that. It looks like a person with a square behind it. Um, feel free to ask your questions on there so that we get to them and we're able to answer all of those. Sometimes we might miss them in the chat. So be sure to use that if you do have questions. There are no polls for the third tab, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, and then you can also see the little three people on the fourth tab. It's just people who are here. Um, so feel free to... Um, talk with each other, send messages on the inbox at the very, very top. Um, you can inbox anybody you wish. So um, you're good to go. And um, if Mr. Eric has anything that he wants to share as far as files, that's the very last tab. It looks like papers stacked up. So please use those to your advantage. Um, we're going to give one more minute. And hey, Michelle, City of Little Rock. Um, if y'all need anything, please let us know. Um, Eric, we, I will hand this over. Please give everyone just like one more minute, okay? So this workshop today is um, Fort Worth's Urban Village Development Program. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Your presenter is Mr. Eric Flatiger. Eric, thank you so much for being with us today. And um, I don't know if someone volunteered you <laughs> or you just volunteered, I'm kidding. But um, thank you so much for the workshop. And if you'll just introduce yourself, introduce your workshop and take it away. All right, thank you, Brenda. Uh, yes, my name is Eric Flatiger. I'm a uh, conference planning manager for the city of Fort Worth. Uh, my team is responsible for uh, the conference plan of the city, uh, which we update on a regular basis, uh, as well as uh, transoriented development planning, urban village planning, uh, some of that implementation work that goes along with those as well, uh, and a variety of area plans, other things. Uh, we have our fingers in a lot of pies, but um, I'm going to share with you a little bit of information today about Fort Worth's Urban Village Development Program. Um, so here we go. Okay, so uh, some of you are uh, likely familiar with the explosive growth that's occurred in Fort Worth. It's occurred in really all the major cities in Texas. Uh, this chart is just showing where we're at now, and this was actually the, the 2019 census figure, the 909,000. Uh, we're expected to uh, reach a million uh, well before 2030 at the rate we're growing. And, um, and uh, you know, we're going to be uh, over uh, 1.4 million by 2045 based on our MPO's projections. Uh, so it's a rapidly growing city. Uh, we're actually the 13th largest city in the United States uh, right now. Um, we've been growing at, as I said, a rapid clip. We're, we're, if we're not the top city, large city in terms of growth rate, we're usually tied for first or second, uh, have been for, for really uh, almost two decades at this point. Uh, but <clears throat> that growth has not been even. It's not been necessarily, uh, you know, what we would consider, uh, you know, the best plan. Uh, Texas is very much a, a uh, property rights state. Uh, we don't have some of the rules that are available uh, from the, the state level in that places like Oregon, places like Washington. I saw a Washington attendee is on the line. Um, and so we don't have some of those those growth management tools. We don't certainly don't have urban growth boundaries and uh, don't have uh, the ability to really control uh, the rate of growth uh, with with robust tools. Consequently, we're, we're second in growth, uh, but we're 18th in density of the top 
uh, of the top city. So out of 20, we're almost at the very bottom. So that is not a predicament that is uh, unique to us or unique to Texas. Really, uh, that's the way we've grown in the last 50 years. So this is what it looks like just from the decade of 2000 to 2010. Uh, the colors indicate rapidly growing areas in the dark brown and less so as the colors get light. And then that gray color is actually population loss. So during the first decade of the 2000s, the city of Fort Worth central city area, and that's within that red circle there, actually for the most part was losing population. So expansion out into the far-flung suburbs uh, and uh, you know, much less so inside the inner city areas. So that blob that you see, City of Fort Worth, is huge. We have 350 square miles within city limits. We have another 300 square miles on the periphery of the city limits, which is called our extraterritorial jurisdiction. So enormous growth going on. So this is a more updated picture. So this is uh, from 2010 to 2045, uh, the growth projections. And you can see the center of the city is now showing up with that darker growth color. And part of that is the planning that's taken place in the city of Fort Worth. Urban Village Development Program is a component of that. Uh, and there are other planning efforts that, that have taken place, but really the city of Fort Worth has made a concerted effort uh, to, um, to promote growth uh, within the downtown area, within the near uh, downtown areas uh, associated with urban villages, growth centers, uh, other planning tools that we have at our disposal. So yes, we're still expanding outwards, we're still growing in some of the far-flung areas, uh, but we really turned the corner and have gotten a great deal more growth going on uh, very close to downtown, the city center area. So that explosive growth that I just described has got some real significant impacts and, and you all I think are probably quite aware of these. Uh, besides the fact that everybody uh, has to have a car in the family that's of driving age uh, in order to get anywhere if you're in those far flung suburban areas, uh, there are a lot of other impacts, uh, pollution, uh, greater risk of traffic fatalities because you simply got lots more people on the road in a hurry to get somewhere because it takes them 20, 25, 30 minutes or more to get where they're going. Um, lower rates of walking, that leads to chronic illnesses, obesity, and actually social isolation, which we've all been practicing <laughs> uh, not for our own benefits um, this year. So those are the kinds of things that really uh, happen to a city and happen to the city's population uh, when you do have that explosive outward growth. And, particularly if you're leaving the center city behind. So, um, as, I, as I said, uh, my team's responsible for the comprehensive plan. Um, our comprehensive plan uh, really does uh, focus to a great deal on uh, incentivizing, encouraging, promoting growth to happen in uh, the central city areas. Um, and to the extent that we can continue that and encourage that more, that really has a lot of benefits uh, to the city, but the comprehensive plan is full of policies that really are focused on uh, that central city development, central city revitalization. So the comprehensive plan, uh, many of you know this, if you work for a city, it's a general guide for making decisions about growth and development in the city. Uh, starts with a broad vision of what that future looks like, describes policies, programs, and projects that help to realize that vision. Uh, this is just a table of contents. Um, the, uh, I've used this slide for, for healthy planning, uh, healthy development related presentations in the past, and that's what that blue color is indicating. There's a, and, and the slide that I just showed you about the chronic health impacts. Uh, our comprehensive plan does a great deal to try to focus on improving health of the of the residents. Uh, the green boxes are outlining areas that actually include specific language related to the uh, urban village development program itself. So you and so there's policy language um, and descriptive language in a number of different chapters: land use, housing, economic development, of course, urban design, of course but also public health and capital improvements and, and other areas. So um, specific 
to health, a, a lot of folks have seen a, a slide very similar to this. Uh, you know, we we spend a lot of money in, in the United States on medical care, uh, and really it, it amounts to about 10% of the actual health of, of people. Um, lifestyle and environment have a much greater impact on how healthy people are. Um, and what you'll learn here in, as we move forward is that the Urban Village Development Program actually sort of targets that, uh, that aspect of life as well and uh, looks at these uh, individual areas. These are specific issues related to growth, commercial development, multifamily, transportation. And what we've done through the last 20 years is really changed the direction from this dispersed development pattern to really focusing on multiple growth centers. Instead of single use commercial quarters, focusing on mixed use villages, uh, targeted mixed use, multifamily, uh, multimodal transportation rather than the highway emphasis that we certainly were known for before that. So one of the other reasons that it's important to focus on central city areas, focus on creating opportunities for different housing choices um, in areas that are close to jobs, uh, close to, uh, to retail and, and so forth, uh, is uh, the question of where do people really want to live? Uh, if you ask folks, you'll get some interesting answers. And of course, the National Association of Realtors has uh, done a good job of surveying uh, people across the country for, for years. So this is a fairly recent survey, and I like the way that they presented this. Uh, what this really is showing is that if you give the people the option of where to live, um, virtually half of them will choose to live in a walkable urban kind of environment, whether that is within a, you know, in the suburbs um, or whether it's actually close to downtown. They're really looking for that mix of uses, mix of residential types, the opportunity to walk to a variety of, uh, to a variety of stores or shops or jobs, uh, parks and green spaces and so forth. Um, so if you, if you let people choose, they'll look for that mixed use walkable kind of environment, whether it's in the city center or it's in the suburban areas. So you can see on this chart, the suburban residential only amounts for 12%. So lots of people were asked um, and basically one in, one in 10 of them or so uh, said, yes, I wanna live in suburbia where I have to drive to get anywhere. Now, unfortunately, um, this is a picture of Fort Worth, but you know it's very similar in other rapidly growing areas. Um, this is not the kind of housing that we've actually provided um, over the last um, you know 50 years or so. Um, the mixed use zoning um, is shown in orange. It's a pretty small percent, about eight percent. So most of the housing that we have in the city of Fort Worth is auto oriented suburbs. So um, that's not lining up with the market demand particularly well, as you just saw in that last slide. What people want is they're really looking for mixed use walkable development, at least 50% of them if you give them that opportunity. So uh, mixed use development is a combination of different but compatible uses, can be within a single building or district or site. Uh, it's very focused on pedestrian Safety, pedestrian comfort, uh, contains elements of live work play, maximizes space usage. So it's more, uh, it's more efficient from a land use standpoint, uh, as well as from an infrastructure standpoint. Amenities, architectural expression, so it's not a, a dull place, uh, mitigates traffic and infrastructure costs associated with sprawl. So these are some really significant um, you know, advantages. So the slides, uh, the images you see, typical commercial district is on the far left. And really what you see there is very large parking lots in front of uh, stores. Um, next to it is the mixed use commercial district where um, that type of environment can be uh, improved with the introduction of housing and essentially a denser environment that provides more walkability. And of course, the next step beyond that image is a more significant retrofit of a suburban uh, commercial area that 
uh, takes advantage of buildings that it can, but removes buildings that uh, really are, are not relevant anymore. Uh, the two images on the right are sort of office focused. Again, with the introduction of housing, um, that, that creates a much more pedestrian friendly environment. So what might these areas look like? Showed you just a couple of images already, but um, I'm gonna show you some more. So this is uh, really a walkable mixed use uh, area. Uh, it's a sketch. This is actually associated with a form-based code district at one of our new, actually hasn't opened yet, new uh, commuter rail station locations. Uh, but you can see what it's providing. It's providing a, a mix of uses. It's very walkable. It's very attractive and comfortable. Uh, very safe, focusing on um, the pedestrians and the cyclists rather than on moving cars quickly, which is what, of course, we've been building for 50, 60 years. This is another image. This is more sort of a residential type area. So this is, you know, these types of units are fronting green space that's shared as uh, community resource and the uh, vehicle access does exist, but it's in the back uh, via alleys. Uh, but again, sort of focusing on that pedestrian experience, the porches are, are right on the sidewalks. There's no large setbacks. In this case, the green space is actually shared. So we built quite a bit of this in Fort Worth already. This, I'm gonna show you some images here. This is the Magnolia Urban Village. Um, it happens to be a form-based code district. Not all of our urban villages are based on form-based codes, but uh, they, they use mixed-use zoning uh, at, to, to you know, bring them about. But you can see the images here, again, it's, it's more dense. It's not unpleasantly dense. They're, you know, they're in fact, very, very cool places to be. Uh, they do have a lot of pedestrian amenities associated with see the pedestrian streetlights, the white sidewalks, uh, and so forth in this image. It's another example. This is West 7th Urban Village. Um, and here we've got uh, our urban residential uh, district, zoning district and uh, mixed use districts. We have two of them, I mean one and two, based on density. Uh, but you can see, again, it's, it's a different form than certainly you're accustomed to seeing in the suburbs. Doesn't mean it can't be done in the suburbs, but it uh, typically takes some focused effort. So this is the near south side, just south of downtown, also known as the medical district. Again, part of that same form-based code district. This is about a thousand acres in total, um, has hospitals, has um, you know, other commercial associated with it, but really has gone from a completely run down area uh, with a lot of vacant land, vacant lots, burned out buildings and so forth. Uh, to what you see here. This is the kind of development that's coming in uh, very rapidly. Uh, Edwards Ranch is an example of a suburban version of an urban village. Um, it is a newly developed area, uh, but you can see really the concepts are the same. It's very pedestrian focused. It's a mix of uses, uh, somewhat denser uh, than the typical suburban environment. This is a very popular place. Um, you know, the property values were fairly high in this area, uh, in part because of where it's located. Uh, Pinnacle Bank, this is, uh, this is adjacent to the downtown. You can certainly see the Omni Hotel in the background there. Uh, this is sort of at the northern edge of the South Main Urban Village. Uh, so it's associated with an urban village. It's also associated with uh, transit-oriented development. There's a passenger rail station uh, very close to this site within, within walking distance. Uh, museum Place uh, in the West 7th Urban Village. Again, this is the mixed use zoning. Uh, just another example. You can see that's a that's a very appealing place to be. Uh, I mentioned uh, South Main Urban Village uh, near the TOD, and this is just some of the uh, recent development that's occurred there. We've also uh, rebuilt the street, spent about eight and a half million total, um, and. In, installed a, a lot of pedestrian amenities in that area. So uh, I mentioned that the bank, that there is significant demand. So who's driving that? Um, there's this is giving you some of that information. The uh, yellow highlighted area. These are folks in their ages that say their ideal neighborhood is mixed use. So um, 
and, and it, it runs it runs pretty consistent. Um, so younger folks over 50%, over 60, over 60% uh, really prefer to live in that kind of an environment. Um, the, the circles that you see uh, provide some information that's, that's pretty relevant as well. Um, the one on the far right, 90% of people prefer living within easy walk to places in their community. Um, the, the other 90% are there. Uh, people prefer neighborhoods closer to open spaces, trails, and recreation. Uh, and then the one that's 55% there, uh, uh, these are folks that are willing to forego a, a standard suburban home and yard if they could live within walking distance of schools, stores, and restaurants. And then the one on the far left that favor walkable neighborhood with a mix of um, houses, stores, and businesses at 60%. So again, that that's pretty significant demand that is not being met. Um, so more, fo more information on the folks that are driving that demand. So empty nesters, uh, and y'all are familiar with this, uh, it's a growing uh, group in terms of the percentage in, in the city and in the, in the country. Uh, folks in that, in the empty nester boomer uh, group are living longer, they're more active, uh, they don't want to live in a traditional retirement community, but they know they aren't going to drive forever. Um, and they don't want to be dependent on people for their tra everyday transportation. So many of these folks uh, are moving into areas that uh, provide, you know, instead of large suburban homes, provide convenient access uh, to a variety of different uh, uses and in a variety of different housing choices. So millennials is another key group. Um, these folks are 25% of the population at this point, technologically savvy, they're very mobile, and, and you know, my son and his friends are, are certainly in that group. They really think about where they want to live, and then they worry about a job, which is totally unique. We, we used, you know, for, for a long time, um, you live near your job, and you, you know, you hope to get a job, and once you got the job, you pretty much stayed there unless they transferred you or you had some other reason to leave. It's a totally different world now. Um, and these folks, the millennials, are willing to accept less individual space in favor of more uh, flexible solutions, mixed use neighborhoods, and, and so forth. So, um, and here's another just purely demographic component. Um, this is from the Urban Land Institute. Uh, if that middle row that you see, houses without children are growing and um, 1960, about half, and then by 2025, which is just a few years away, 72% of the households won't have kids. So if you don't have kids, you may not need the yard, um, and you may not you know, care in terms of the school district quality. Now, there obviously will be a lot of families who do and who will, and there'll be families that transition through different housing choices over time, and you know that's, that's something that as planners is really important for us to provide those opportunities. So um, again, just on a little bit on the, the millennials, they prefer walking, we talked about that. They prefer living in attached housing within walking distance to shops and restaurants. Um, and they really support public trans transportation. It helps them uh, live the kind of life that they're interested in. So this, so this, brings us back to kind of why uh, urban villages and, and what these places are and what they look like. So uh, City of Fort Worth has an urban village development program. These are the kind of places we're trying to create with it. Um, when you think about new development, you've in, you know, particularly commercial oriented areas, you really have a couple of choices. One is your standard auto-oriented, auto low intensity, single use commercial corridor. And if this was a live group, I'd ask everybody to raise their hands and, and tell me, um, you know, if they knew this particular street, because everybody's seen it. Um, and this is another version. So pedestrian oriented, higher intensity, mixed use district. So a lot, you know, of the same components that I just showed you in terms of the streetscape, in terms of the uh, the moderate density in terms of the walkability and safety for pedestrians, uh, orientation toward the street, 
um, really a place that's kind of fun to be. Um, this street, just by the way, is actually just a, a, modif a graphic, graphically modified image of the one you just saw. So uh, it's basically this or this. That's the choices that we have. So development options, uh, we've been building single use districts for a long time. Um, mixed use neighborhoods are quite different. Um, and, and, you know, our, our, what is de being demanded in uh, certainly among uh, folks that are looking for housing. So large setbacks is typical of suburbia. Um, street line with storefronts is more of an urban environment. So an urban village is an urbanized place with a mix of uses, jobs, public spaces, transportation connections, pedestrian activity, and a sense of place. So why are these locations important? A lot of reasons. One is it's meeting that demand. So I just showed you this slide, but I just wanted to remind you that, that there is a large component of demand for housing that is not being meant that basically is stuck with what's been built, what's being built. Uh, we've got, you know, a financing system that still is very, very good at churning out single family, low density subdivisions and, and suburban sprawl. And, and we've been doing that since World War II. Uh, it's, it's a very efficient way for people to make money who are in those industries. Mixed use development is not quite as efficient, a little bit more challenging. Um, but the demand is there. Uh, also, the commercial strip that I just showed you um, really is facing a lot of challenges, has been for, uh, for a while now, if you've been paying attention to that. Uh, this is a quote that I like from uh, Urban Land Institute. The future belongs to town centers, main streets, and mixed-use development. And that's really um, kind of been accelerated by COVID as well. So uh, another reason is just simply from a standpoint of what is the cost of building these places, um, it's, it's completely different. So conventional standard suburban development where everything's separated and you've got you know, linear cul-de-sacs and windy roads and they're not connected to anything, uh, that kind of development is expensive. And from the standpoint of sort of on a per unit, so per household basis, uh, it's significantly more expensive than a more urban environment where you've got uh, more households uh, and they're paying, uh, you know, that costs less per household. So a third less for upfront infrastructure, saves about 10% on ongoing uh, delivery of city services, generates 10 times more tax revenue per acre, and I'll show you that in a moment, than conventional suburban development. So this is an example. So this, this is actually places in Fort Worth. Um, the big box super center on the left um, occupies 25 acres. Um, yeah, it generates property tax, sales tax, and so forth. But on a, a per acre perspective, uh, the city's portion of property taxes for this development is 5,000 bucks an acre. Um, which isn't very much. And you can see a lot of that space is wasted on a half-used parking lot. Um, higher intensity mixed use area, this is part of the West 7th Urban Village on the right. Um, it's smaller, um, it's more intense in terms of its uses, it's more efficient, there's lots more going on and more to do, so it's fun. Um, the, um, the, the city's uh, tax revenue per acre there is over one hundred seventeen thousand dollars. So five thousand versus one hundred seventeen thousand, um, that's a huge difference. So another another view. This is suburban multifamily on the left and urban multifamily on the right. Same story. Um, it's significantly more uh, uh, benefit from the standpoint of uh, cost of services as well as tax revenue generation. Um, just individual housing on the left is one of our standard uh, single family subdivisions that's been built not too long ago. That's kind of what they look like, and they look like that pretty much everywhere in the country uh, when they're newly built. Um, the per acre tax revenue that's generated from that is about 13000 
a year on the left or on the right, uh, it's that same uh, urban multifamily project that's generating uh, 63,000. So 63,000 versus 13,000 per acre. So based on sort of all those benefits, all the demand, all the reasons that this is important, um, the city uh, started its program in about 2000, really looking at uh, commercial corridors in the city that had been just flat run down. Um, you know, a lot of retail just flew out to the, the newest uh, areas of the suburbs outside of this loop road that you see. This is Loop 820. Uh, inside the loop is the area that we refer to typically as the central city. Uh, and then outside are newer suburban areas. Uh, lots of rundown commercial um, quarters in the city uh, back in 2000. So we selected locations, typically major intersections in these areas, um, and created these urban villages. So they were established by city council. There are 16 of them. Uh, actually 17, the one that you see that's just a blue dot on the far right is our newest, um, and that is the Lake Arlington Urban Village. Uh, but they all were identified essentially by the community and, and put forth by the community, um, and, and there were others that, that weren't selected that were put forward by the community, and they went through a process uh, that looked at, you know, what the, what the opportunities are, what the infrastructure is, what would this make sense as a mixed-use walkable place? So these are the ones that did pass. So we promote the development of urban villages really three main ways. So uh, mixed-use zoning, I've talked a lot about mixed-use zoning, form-based code, urban residential zoning. Um, we apply mixed-use zoning, uh, which really focuses on higher density pedestrian-oriented development. Um, and we apply those essentially in all of the urban villages. In fact, we won't move on to the other things um, until we get that in place. Because it, if we start um, offering economic incentives, if we start um, putting in additional capital improvements, and the mixed use zoning isn't there, then essentially we've spent a lot of money just dressing up a suburban location, which it is nice to do, and, and you know, we certainly like to have the resources to do that all over the place, but, in, but we can't. So we have to prioritize and we have to try to make the places that respond to the demand uh, for housing that's out there and for the, for the walkable places. Um, and so that's why we limit our resources to a smaller number. So uh, we also apply economic incentives uh, to make, and really the goal is to sort of balance the playing field between the cost of developing in urban infill areas versus the cost of uh, suburban locations. If you're out in the greenfield, it's pretty inexpensive uh, comparatively to build a new street, build new stuff. Uh, there's, there's nothing underground that you have to worry about hitting that you didn't know you were there, that was there. And we have had that experience um, uh, in some locations and that could uh, add cost to those projects. So the capital improvements, and I'll show you some images related to these, the, each of these things, but the capital improvements are, are really key. They're also pretty expensive, uh, but they really change, they transform the physical environment in conjunction with the other two components of the, of the program. So first, mixed-use zoning. Um, mixed-use uh, zoning has two components in the city of Fourth. ME1 is low intensity, ME2 is high intensity. They're basically the same thing, but they're, you know, the ME2 is just a more uh, dense environment. Um, so that is one type of zoning we use. I mentioned form based codes. We use a lot of those in the city of Fort Worth, and they're typically uh, in areas that are either designated urban villages or they're designated mixed use growth centers or, or trans oriented development areas. So um, here's a, a map just showing, again, this is the central city area, which is large, it's a lot bigger than most cities. Uh, but um, you know, this area is showing you in pink, uh, the mixed use one and mixed use two zoning uh, locations. The gray is designated mix, mixed use growth centers. The black outline with the crosshatch uh, are urban villages. 
So these are the urban village areas. They're not large. Uh, most of them are, are actually uh, fairly small and, and very walkable as they are. Um, a lot of those areas, particularly in the gray, in the area south of downtown, the center there, you can see the street pattern of downtown. Immediately to the south of it is the South Main Urban Village and, and sort of adjacent to that is the Magnolia Urban Village. And those are the ones that are covered by a form-based code. And we have, as I said, other form-based codes in the city for other similar areas. So the, regarding the financial incentives, the typical means is the neighborhood empowerment zone. Um, and it's basically a, a state uh, authorized tool that we use uh, that is used for distressed areas, uh, provides uh, the opportunity for incentives uh, to promote affordable housing, economic development, and expanded public services. Um, specific incentives that we can use in, in these neighborhood empowerment zone areas include tax and fee incentives. So we've got a waiver of fees. Development fees can be pretty expensive. Uh, if you're doing particularly a, a large project, those fees can be waived uh, by the city for uh, projects that are taking place in urban villages. Uh, we have uh, tax abatement opportunities as well, uh, which is very helpful. Um, we do uh, get in uh, to some grants and loans, particularly um, as they relate to economic development. Um, and that can create, um, a, you know, take a project that doesn't pencil out and, and help it pencil out. Uh, so public improvements, uh, there's a variety of them that can go in and, and I'll show you uh, one of our more common ones in a moment. So we like sidewalks. Sidewalks are not new. So this is um, this is an old photo, as you might be able to tell. This is actually Pompeii uh, in Italy. So uh, you know, circa 50 AD or something like that. So we've been building sidewalks all a long time, um, and we've kind of gotten away from it in, in places after World War II. Um, Kind of an, another another fun slide. Um, street. If you are a pedestrian and your street is designed primarily for motor vehicles to move traffic as efficiently as possible, which has been the standard since World War II, uh, this is what you see, and and I think everybody can kind of get that. It's not a comfortable place. It's clearly not designed for your benefit. Uh, plus, um, getting places. Um, since World War II has gotten a lot more difficult, take a lot longer if you're on foot. So um, I'm not using a, a particular slide that I like to use related to this, but uh, on, on that slide, you got on the left a picture of the Brady Bunch, on the right a picture of uh, Homer Simpson and his family, and, um, and basically the, the statistics just are indicating that there's been a dramatic drop in kids walking to school. Uh, and part of it is because on the left, walking to school was easier, it was safe. On the right, walking to school is longer, more difficult, takes you out onto arterials, which are unfriendly and unsafe for kids uh, walking to school. So we kind of built this environment to not be uh, helpful from a health or from a safety standpoint for pedestrians. So these are kind of the element, standard elements of a pedestrian-friendly urban street. Um, On-street parking is key. Street trees, those two items alone, that vertical element and the, the on-street parking, provide a barrier between moving traffic and pedestrians, which makes um, the, uh, the street itself a, essentially a public space that people like. So, and people, and you know, and you'll see You'll see the tables and chairs out there, and uh, a lot of things are going on now related to turning parking into uh, pedestrian um, furnished areas. So if you're familiar with that program, that's been pretty successful in a lot of places. So this just gives you a visual of what those kind of things look like, and I'll give you photos coming up. Uh, streetscape improvements, and that's kind of the term that we use instead of landscape, this is streetscape. Um, are crucial in these kinds of areas. They make a big impact. Uh, they provide uh, lighting upgrades for pedestrian safety at night. They make an area obviously more attractive, as you can see from these images. Uh, they make parcels more attractive for developers and enhance economic viability, which is key 
uh, to the Urban Village program because it's also a revitalization program. Um, it obviously increases safety um, and obviously it has, well, maybe not so obviously, but it provides opportunities to implement access management, which is um, a safety measure, not just for pedestrians, but also for vehicles. So you're not seeing figures that uh, you should be seeing, but you're seeing the totals, which is okay. Uh, from a variety of sources, we have amassed or about $50 million, and the number is actually a little larger now than it was when this slide was produced. Um, and from a variety of different sources, we have used a lot of city funds, obviously, but a lot of federal grants, a lot of regional grants. Um, we have worked with um, partners, so development partners. We worked with um, uh, tax and government financing districts. Um, to, to create the funds available. I mean, cities put in bond funds and so forth as well, but significant contributions from a variety of partners to make the money available to do this. I mentioned uh, tax increment financing di districts or TIFs for short. Um, they are a very useful a tool, basically takes a sort of freezes the, the tax um, uh, value of an area within the, its boundary uh, at a specific point in time and then and then from there until however long the tip is, is functional for whether it's 10 20 years or more um, that increment the change in value drives additional property tax revenue that tax revenue uh, that increment it's called uh, goes into a special fund that is then used specifically for improvements inside the TIF boundary. So TIF has to have a board, it has to have a specific plan that's adopted by council. Uh, but as you can see, the yellow boundaries overlaying this, the black color, um, the black color is a variety of tax increment financing districts that the city of Fort Worth has. Uh, and the yellow is urban villages that, that obviously there's a becomes a funding mechanism available if you have both the urban village and the TIF in the same location. So just some examples of uh, these pedestrian streetscape projects that we have already completed uh, in urban villages. Uh, I like to quote here, pedestrians not only uh, generate direct sales, they create a magnetism that makes a place more inviting, which in turn yields more sales. So from a business standpoint, uh, the Urban Village program is, uh, is very well supported by the business community. Uh, some examples of what these things look like, again, really focused on creating a, a walkable environment, a place that draws people. So that's the goal, it's not just to make a safe place, it's a, to make a place that people recognize, you'd say, I, yeah, I went and had dinner at uh, South Main uh, Urban Village and, and people across the region will know what you're talking about and, and where you went and they probably went to the same restaurant. That's the kind of sort of dynamism that we're after here. So in terms of results, just a few slides to share here. Um, so this slide uh, used to say what can happen in five years and I changed it. <laughs> it's been a few more years, but really a lot of what I'm going to show you occurred in within a five year and certainly within a, time, a 10 year time frame. So this is our West 7th urban village that you're looking at. So this is what it looked like before the redevelopment started. And I'm just, I'll am just i show you a different portion of it in a moment, but sort of get this solidified in your brain. This is something that everybody's seen things that look like this. This is what it looks like now. So the, essentially the photograph is taken at almost precisely the same place, looking in the same direction. Uh, but you can see there's a big difference between that and this. And you're probably more likely to be walking in this environment. And certainly a lot of people are living in this environment. Here's another example. This is Oleander Street in the near south side. This is uh, part of that form based code. That I was talking about. So this is what it used to look like. Not very inviting. This is what it looks like now. Same place. So big difference. A lot of rundown stuff, a lot of vacant lots. Boom. So this is a place that people go to. So this 
photo is taken just a, a block or two from Magnolia Avenue, uh, which is part of our Magnolia Urban Village, as is this street itself. And I'll show you that in a moment. This is Crockett Street. So this is the core of the um, West 7th Urban Village before. And this is it now. So big difference before and after. So this is Magnolia Village. This, this street, Magnolia Avenue, actually won a Great Streets Award from the American Planning Association. And it often looks like that. It's been a little bit less during the, the you know, the, the peak of COVID, but uh, this is the kind of environment that we're aiming for. It's very vibrant, a lot of economic activity, a lot of very successful businesses. This particular street is uh, also known as our restaurant row. Uh, there are lots of great independent eateries and, and drinking establishments, as well as some really cool boutique shops and things like that. And there's a lot of new residential development that's occurring in the area. It just happens to be immediately adjacent to one of the largest historic districts. Uh, they used to be very run down and, and not at all a place people wanted to go to. And now it's just, it's fabulous. Um, and, and it's a place that, you know, so much renovation has taken place. It's, it's something you want to see. Okay, so uh, benefits of um, successful urban villages, stimulates reinvestment in targeted areas enhances property values and tax revenues. It decreases crime in central city areas, directs, redirects some of the growth to the central city, uh, enhances sustainability, rebuilds community cohesion and pride, and improves overall community livability. That's what I have for you. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, really love talking about our Urban Village Development Program and love seeing how it's really changed Fort Worth in pretty significant ways. So uh, Brenda, if you wanna help out with the questions and we can move, move on to that. Yeah, if you'll close your presentation for me, please. I will do that. And one of the first questions that came through is, what is form-based code? Okay, good question. Um, so form-based code is a type of zoning, and, and you're probably familiar with zoning sort of in general. It, you know, something is zoned for residential, or it's zoned for commercial, or it's zoned for industrial. And there are a variety of different types within each of those kinds of categories, and there are other categories as well. So zoning, Typical zoning is also referred to as Euclidean zoning due to a uh, Supreme Court case affecting uh, um, Euclid um, and, and a, basically a, a location in Ohio where they said, yes, it's a good thing. Supreme Court said, yes, we, we think cities should be able to separate uses. They should be able to say where places go rather than not. So if you're familiar with Houston, Houston does not have zoning. Uh, so it's a little bit more of a mishmash um, in terms of where things are located. Uh, but standard Euclidean and zoning has also done some disservice to communities in that we have, in fact, made it pretty impossible to walk from, say, a house to a store or to your workplace or to a school or a library. All that stuff's got to happen by cars. And part of that is a result of standard Euclidean and zoning. So form-based codes throw that out the window. So standard zoning says, is focused on uses, focused on residential or commercial. Well, you can't have them together. Uh, we can't have that. Um, form-based code is form-based. So it's focused on the physical built environment and for the most part, doesn't care what uses are there. What it does care about is is the buildings and how building how close to the street the buildings are. Typically, form-based codes put the buildings very close to the street, put the parking uh, behind, um, try to create a place where the pedestrian is king and cars are there, uh, but cars are not in the middle of things um, and, and sort of the major uh, focal point. So 
Form-based codes uh, have a lot to say about design. They have a lot to say about building heights and how the building addresses the street and transparency of, of windows on the ground floor and types of architectural features, um, a variety of different things that together create the, in the, in the development community and in the neighborhood, um, create the expectation, the certainty that as development occurs, it's going to follow the rules and it's going to contribute to a place becoming more and more and more walkable and pedestrian friendly and just a cool place to be. Um, so that's the difference between form-based codes and, um, and standard zoning. Form-based codes also make much greater use of graphics to convey their message. Awesome. So this one's going to be a two-part question, or I'm going to make it a two-part question. <laughs> How do we take part in the comprehensive plan, particularly how can neighborhood associations have a seat at the table where they can provide in? Okay, so that sounds like a, a Fort Worth resident, but if not, it might be a similar situation in, in your city. Um, so um, the conference plan is, is intended to be the citywide growth and development plan. Um, uh, a component of that that's important is public engagement um, and, and and, and to be honest, we uh, following uh, the um, the last economic um, crash that we had, uh, we lost a lot of staff. So we used to do we used to go out to neighborhood associations every year. Uh, we used, we used to actually send emails and say, "Hey, you got a meeting where we can come and talk about the conference of plan." Um, so we're we're starting to work towards that again um, as we as we are able to build up our staff resources to do that, but. Uh, if there's a specific neighborhood group that's on this call and in Fort Worth that's interested in the conference plan, please uh, uh, contact me, um, and we'll see if we can set something up uh, to come out and talk to you. Great. And then, is there any development done for low-income housing? Development for low-income housing. So, um, so low. So there's a variety of terms affordable housing, low-income housing, uh, attainable housing, um, and the, the Urban Village Development Program provides support for those. Um, we have projects where through low-income housing tax credits and other means, the city has been able to support development of affordable housing, either as a component of a larger project, and we've done a lot of that, um, or as a standalone project, we've done some of that, but not quite as much. We find that, um, particularly in a place like an urban village, um, it's often helpful to have affordable units uh, be a component of a market rate project uh, and to try to do it in more and more market rate projects in that area so that uh, you're, you're not only uh, allowing the development community uh, to feel incentivized to build affordable units, um, but you're also creating opportunity districts where uh, where there are more there are more jobs, there are more things to do, there are more you know resources or variety of sorts in a location where the folks that are in those affordable units are immersed in um, in opportunity where they certainly wouldn't be in sort of the standard. Uh, approach to affordable housing where you find a place where the neighbors don't squawk too much and there's some vacant land and then you put them in that location and unfortunately very often those locations have also been in low-income areas uh, which kind of is contrary to sort of the modern understanding of how to how to you know get people out of poverty you don't surround them by more poverty you give them opportunities and and access and where are you getting or where are they getting the information on stats being used? So it depends on what stats you're referring to. So I shared a lot of information about the market um, and a lot of that comes from uh, the, the, um, the real estate community. So the Builders Association, Urban Land Institute, um, there's a professor at, uh, I think he's still at University of Utah that has done a lot of really great research work on, um, on, on sort of the real estate market and, uh, and particularly on uh, the kinds of developments that are, are now becoming 
uh, more popular, and certainly the market is demanding. So uh, those statistics come from uh, those kinds of sources. So uh, basically research organizations. Are, you, are these urban villages using sustainable energy? That's a, that's a good question. Um, so, so I, obviously in, in Texas, we have a lot of electricity that's produced by wind um, and, and some by solar as well, uh, a lot by natural gas. So just the standard development is certainly taking advantage of those growing um, you know, resources. Um, we don't have a lot of, um, you know, we don't have wind turbines on buildings at this point, although we've had uh, discussions about uh, allowing and encouraging sort of mini, the, the, you know, the newer forms, the mini wind turbines uh, to be uh, allowable in these kinds of environments. Um, I think that one of the things you see is just the, the compactness, the walkability, the mix of uses, that development type, those structures um, tend to be much more uh, energy efficient than low density suburban sprawl. Awesome. So what is the city doing to reduce traffic congestion um, with all the developments? So another good question. So the city of Fort Worth is, is working hard to uh, promote um, better public transportation. Uh, one of the tenets of urban village development program is, is that uh, public transit be a component, be uh, integrated and help to connect those different places. Um, so, um, so, you know, that, that is something that we're trying to move forward with, as, you know, and, and incentivize and invest in. And, um, in areas where we have both urban villages and trans-oriented development opportunities where we've got pedestrian rail stations, that helps to mold the development that takes place in those locations. Um, so there is some traffic congestion and West 7th has, has gotten, gotten a name for that. Um, if you own a business there, um, that traffic congestion is dollars in your pocket, uh, assuming they stop at your shop. Um, one of the things that some of these areas used to be is a place you drove through fast and you put a lot of cars through fast. And that was all they really were. I mean, there were some businesses and, and some residents and so forth, but uh, now they are places in and of themselves, their own destinations and people are drawn to it. So this, yes, that brings cars. Um, yes, we have parking garages and other ways to, to deal with that. Uh, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. If you if you want no traffic, that's what suburbs are all about. So that this we're not building suburbs; we're building walkable places. Potential of higher property tax for the city accelerated use. So um, so that the kinds of development forms I just showed you um, uh, yield a higher property tax per. Um, acre. There's just no question about it. Um, the problem is that any kind of development costs money to build. Uh, the city then has to maintain all that infrastructure in perpetuity. If you have a very low density environment, the tax that's generated from that area that's being served doesn't necessarily cover it. And what we found in some of the uh, some of the work that we've done in terms of the analyses uh, of different development forms is that is like like I showed you, if you have an area that's full of low density uh, neighborhoods and low density uh, commercial and so forth, um, it may not be covering the actual cost of the infrastructure and the maintenance over time. So the areas that are more like what I just showed you that we're trying to build, those areas often are necessary to subsidize low density sprawl. I don't know if that answered the question. Yeah. So as the city sprawls, are we pre-setting up these mixed-use centers and zones via zoning to prevent us having to go back 20 years later and revitalize? That's a great question. Um, yes, we are. I showed you one example of Edwards Ranch, which is 
which is still a suburban area. It's an older suburban area, so it is within Loop 820. Uh, but we have modified our future land use plan, which is part of the comprehensive plan. So it's looking out 20 years, looking at the, where the city's likely to be growing and what kind of land uses we would like to see out there. We have modified a, a number of different locations and changed them so that the land use plan is for mixed use, um, higher density, walkable communities. I've heard a little bit of this on how residents have involved with planning urban, urban villages, but how do urban uh, villages reflect the, the sense of place, culture of the city's demographics? So uh, that's an interesting question. So you caught some of the words that I used in the description. So sense of place is, is really important. Um, it's part of what creates a destination. Um, you want people to recognize it as, an, as a distinct place that has a character that they like, that they want to be there. Um, and, and ideally, what we're trying to achieve is, is, is modifications within those areas that also reflect the character of the community. So, we, you know, it, it's, it's much more authentic and much more of an experience people are seeking out if, if the, the new development, if the, you know, the street improvements and so forth all really reflect the character of the area. So it's not, you know, we're not trying to change the character. If there's no character there and there's just empty land, then that, that can be something different. But uh, otherwise we wanted, the goal is to integrate the neighborhood that surrounds the urban villages with the urban villages themselves. We require as a city for new development to follow more of a block rather than a suburban suburban winding road developments and maybe walled in communities that y'all stay out. I like that question. Um, I don't know who answered it, asked it, but that's a good one. Um, so yeah, so you're you're getting at at essentially the one of the, one of the constraints that the city of Fort Worth has in any city in Texas is that. Growth management is uh, not robust. It's not intended to be robust. And if it gets robust, uh, folks are going to go to the state legislature and the legislature is going to remove that. So um, so we have tried, I mean, the city of Fort Worth has, has, has tried to um, encourage, um, you know, growth management that's focused on infrastructure. So basically, if the infrastructure is not there, then you can't build there without the infrastructure. Um, we, we tried to push that. That's used in, in other cities. Florida is a good example of that. Um, but it just, it, it went nowhere. So, um, so we're in some ways, the development process is really focused on individual property owners, what they want to do and so forth. So, uh, zoning and, and some of the other tools we have can address that to some degree, but not quite as much as we'd like. Subdivision ordinance, is part of that control. Um, our master thoroughfare plan has been uh, updated fairly recently, and we've we've switched it completely from basically talking about arterials to talking about street types and giving graphic pictures of what those different types of streets should be, should contain, and so forth. So, um, so we're working towards that, but um, we we certainly have lots of room to grow. Is the homeless population being considered in these urban village developments and do the these villages accommodate the homeless in a similar So um, so yes and it depends upon the urban village and depends upon the location um, we have uh, we have one uh, urban village that is the urban village itself is snap you know is centered on uh, the homeless district in Fort Worth. So the, the location of all of the homeless services, it's really been concentrated in what's called the Near East Side Urban Village. And that's been the case for decades. Um, and, and so what that, the Urban Village plan is still in place. The Urban Village tools are still in place. We've, you know, we've improved the streets in that area. Um, and, and really the goal in that particular instance was to improve the safety of the homeless population that's there. So that's a circumstance where we've got a lot of homeless folks in that community. 
um, you know, we, we want the urban village to be successful uh, in that location. And to be successful, it has to successfully accommodate the homeless population as well. Uh, we have another urban village, the Six Points Urban Village, uh, where we actually have a permanent supportive housing project that's, that's you know, snap dab in the middle of that urban village. Um, and uh, permanent supportive housing is really a tool that, that the City of Fort Worth and other places are, are trying to use in order to provide wraparound services. So you're providing services to the home, homeless population ideally in places that are not where they currently are. So places, again, get, gets at that opportunity uh, environment. So the Six Points Urban Village is, a, is an example of an opportunity environment. Uh, it's well served by transit. It's got uh, some jobs, it's got a lot of new development taking place there, a lot of new housing. Um, and, and we, you know, as a city, we would like to distribute um, the homeless population into opportunity zone area or opportunity rich areas um, through the permanent supportive housing approach. Um, it's, it, it hasn't been as successful as we would like. Um, there's a lot of pushback from uh, some of the neighborhoods uh, when something is proposed, but um, that's, that's where we are. We're continuing to work on that. Um, where are these projects of low income areas? Are these urban is actually walkable for residents? Many of these projects are in the form of gentrification. Does data show the shopping and visiting the restaurants area? Does data show those shopping and visiting the restaurants area residents? So I think here we have a mixed bag. Um, so uh, the we have uh, 17 urban villages. We have a number of them that are in, you know, they're in different places in the central city. Um, areas that are sort of to the west or the southwest, um, for planners, there's a term called favored quarter. And in most cities, especially large cities uh, in the country, there is a, there's something that, that occurs. So uh, you also often have a conglomeration of high income people that sort of you know, want to be in the same location as the other high income people. Um, and you, you end up developing a favored quarter where that's where the expensive housing is. That's where a lot of the resources go. Other areas of the city are not favored and do not get, you know, have lower income housing and so forth. Um, and, and that's true in, virtually in any American city that you go visit. Um, so we have some very successful urban villages. They tend to be in in the southwest, west or southwest part of the city. Um, now these are areas that were totally run down and bypassed completely and, um, and were in bad shape. But because they were still between where, you know, some of those better off communities are and where downtown is, um, they came back, you know, quickly. The market was very much there to support that. In Southeast Fort Worth, which is a more of a lower income area, uh, much more diverse, um, those urban villages have not been quick, quick to come back. Um, and, and that's, you know, we're, we're, we're working on a variety of different ways to, to assist with that. There is some, some beneficial change that's occurring. You know, we certainly put in a, a few streetscape projects in those areas and so forth, but um, the urban village program can't by itself create market demand for development and create and you know sort of force developers to go build there, uh, but it can make it more attractive, and that's really what we're trying to do. So I'd say Six Points is an area that um, that got pretty run down, um, but that is now coming back in a big way. Uh, I think that it's a mix of of folks there, um, certainly the new construction is probably uh, less diverse than the existing housing in that area, but I think there's still, um, you know, there's still a pretty good mix of folks in that area. So it's a mixed bag, they're not all sec successful, uh, but from the, you know, from the standpoint of, of um, you know, of, of creating places that people people wanna go to and that, and that satisfy uh, housing demand, um, you know, we think that slowly, but we think that those those other areas will begin to change and come back. 
we have about four more minutes. I'm going to try to get to a couple more of these. Um, and I'll make sure that if they didn't get answered, we'll send them to you so that you can send the answer directly to them if needed. Okay. Okay. Um, how does the Hughes house compare with the development being built in the other in other areas of the city? Okay, I'm not sure that I quite got that. Say that again. How does the Hughes house compare with the development being built in the other area of the city? Okay, um, I'm not sure. I, if I heard you correctly, you said Hughes house, and I'm not sure what Hughes house is. Uh, so maybe someone can jump in and explain. Pastor, Pastor Moore, if you can type it in or raise your hand. Unless he's referring to permanent supportive housing, which could be. I'll go ahead and go to the next one while he types that in if he does. If mixed use is what people want, why does City Zoning Commission keep approving massive outlying housing development? So a good question. Um, and, and, and that sort of gets back to the, the fact that Texas is Texas. Texas is not Oregon. It's not Florida. It's not Washington. It's not, Na you know, it's not Nashville or the places that, that really have, have stepped up and just said, we need to manage this growth better. Um, Texas really doesn't allow those tools to be quite as successful or, or, or at all. Uh, as other places. So what that means is that is that you know we're still in a situation where there are, you know the industry that develops um, low density suburban sprawl is is you know they're 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 there and they're doing what um, what they know how to do and what the what the finance really the financial system is established to help them do. Um, and it's profitable and they, you know, they can keep their business running and all that. So you can't fault them for doing it. Um, it's the easiest thing to do. Mixed use is not as easy to do, uh, can be more expensive and more challenging. So, um, so you got folks that are, you know, they're responding to the need for housing and they're providing the housing that they, that has been successful, you know, for decades and that they know they can sell and that they know people can get mortgages for it. And they don't have to condoize their development in order to do it. So it's easier right now for them to do that, um, and and they can sell the houses, so they do it. And Pastor Moore is just waiting to get in, um, so I'll ask one more question because I do have to be at the finalist um, information and do that. Is there anything being done to encourage to encourage and open up opportunity for small developers rather than only large developers that tend to come from outside. So that is a that's another great question. You, you guys are a very smart bunch. Um, yes, there is. A, we would we would we'd love to see small scale development. Um, it is if you look back at sort of the history of the growth of cities. Cities for you know thousands of years grew in small developments, small incremental fashions, and successfully. And it was focused on individuals meeting their needs and the needs of the community and and it was a very walkable place because of that um so we'd love to see that kind of development we do have uh you know locations where uh folks are coming in and buying up you know old warehouse small business you know small buildings and completely redoing them as you know ground floor retail with uh apartments above and so forth south main urban village has quite a bit of that um, and it really has taken you know, historic built environment fabric and revitalized it and made it a place that's cool and that people people want to go to. Um, so there's there's both. You know that we have small scale, we have large scale. Uh, we'd love to get more small scale. I have one more minute, Pastor Warren. If you okay, just I'm sorry. Minute. Okay, Brendan, thank you so much. I'm sorry that my my question didn't come across clear. The Hughes House is the name of the development that's being built by Fort Worth Housing in the uh, Amanda Rosedale area. Oh, right. Okay. So, yeah. um, and so when you were talking and showing urban villages, the concept that's been presented for that project has been on the style of an urban village, but you didn't, you didn't show it as the, 
the developments that you were uh, featuring. So I was just wondering, how does that compare? My camera is set up where I'm after stand. I'm I'm a preacher, so it's set up for Sundays and not for me sitting at my computer. So you don't see me. <laughs> uh, well, happy to have you here with us. Um, very good right. question. Uh, the certainly the the development that's proposed there uh, and then is beginning to move forward um, really is is creating an urban village. It's not designated as an urban village by city council, at least not yet. It could be. Um, and, and and for those that don't know anything about this area, this is this is the site of what's called the Cabell Place um, uh, housing facility. It is in fact the old style public housing. Uh, that public housing is going to be demolished and removed and replaced by um, by something that's very similar to the photos that I just showed you. Kind of you know multi-story, walkable, uh, mix of uses, mix of different housing choices. Um, it's going to really transform the neighborhood, and that's its intention. It's it's got choice neighborhoods funding uh, from HUD, and that's really the goal. So. It's not a designated urban village, which is why you didn't see any of those images in there. And right now, of course, the images are just sketches. They're great sketches, but um, we haven't seen the development uh, begin to come out of the ground. It, it will, and it will be uh, starting uh, pretty quickly and, and make some dramatic change in the area. So good point. It doesn't have to be an urban village to have this kind of development and to address the demand for that kind of housing and the demand for walkability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Pastor Moore, for being able to explain everything. Um, we are going to close this out because we do have to go to our, our next one. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Eric, thank you so much for um, presenting and um, doing everything. If we didn't get to answer your questions, I'll be sure to um, make sure that Eric has those and send them directly to you to, to answer those. I think there was three or four more that we didn't get to. So thank you so much. Just remember that we you will be able to see this presentation starting Sunday or Monday. So just give it time to kind of recollect it itself and you'll have that available until August. Um, if you'll go up there to back to lobby on the top left, you should be good to go. And we'll see y'all um, either at the finalist or in another workshop. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. Thank you, everyone.